man, it's been almost, we're going, this is our seventh year as a church. And I remember starting out, there was a, a lot of advice that, that I got, a lot of which was solicited as we were starting this church and, and things to keep in mind or, or not to keep in mind. And, and one of the repeated words of encouragement I got from a couple of pastor friends who approached me separately with, with this word of counsel was this. Hey, as you guys start this young church, of course, now we're talking about almost seven years ago back at the Little White Church on 700 East where just a handful or two of us were gathered to form this thing that would become Oak Grove Community Church. They said, let me warn you that as you start this thing and, and you begin to live out and carry out your vision, beware of those folks who are going to show up at your church ready to hijack your vision and, and to implement their own. He said, they said, because the world is full, in fact, the church is full of disgruntled visionaries who have gone from church to church, each time leaving disappointed and saddened by the fact that nobody else in the church got it but them. And so as they see a new thing starting, they're going to see that as an opportunity to, to try it again. And they'll come and they'll, they'll try to hijack it and maybe get you off course and go down the road with a vision of their own. And I, I guess he, they meant you guys. But so far, so good. <laughs> I think about that as I think about Paul's letter to the Galatians. And that, that this church had formed with a deliberate and a faithful and a biblically centered and a Christ-honoring gospel and foundation, which began and ended with the grace of Jesus Christ who offered life on the cross. And yet after that church is, is planted and it's, a, it's a, a, a struggling young church and growing, some folks come in and they start trying to hijack the vision of that church and take it an entirely different direction. As Paul opens his letter to the Galatians with a passionate defense of the foundational truth of the Christian faith, and this is a defense which we're going to see carries on and continues, even intensifies as he writes. It is very apparent that the argument for those opposing him, for these other people who had come along the side of, into this church and were trying to hijack the vision, vision, it's apparent that their arguments were persuasive. Larry talked about this and touched upon this a couple of weeks ago. But, but these men came down from Jerusalem and they had everything on their side as they began to preach what ultimately is a different gospel. These guys had chapter and verse of the law, ready to cite it, ready to quote it, or perhaps more appropriately to misquote it or to misapply it to persuade these people that the vision that we're coming to you with is the God-ordained vision. And we can cite the chapter and verse of Scripture, Old Testament, to prove it to you. They could look, for instance, to Genesis chapter 17, where they would read and remind people that circumcision is described there as an eternal ordinance, part of God's eternal law. And that anyone who wasn't circumcised was to be cut off from the community of God's people and rejected from the covenant community, community of God's people. For anyone in the church, and this would have been everybody, desiring security in their faith, I mean, desiring security in this new journey with Christ that they're on, this stuff would have been terrifying. Because now they're hearing something that's questioned what they've been told, something that's questioning what they founded their newfound faith on, and telling them, hey, it's at risk if you don't listen to us and do certain things. These spiritual carpetbaggers also came down from the mother church headquarters where the apostles had lived and walked with Jesus. So in addition to scripture and verse of the Bible, which they can quote, they, they've got that sort of mantle of apparent handed down authority. They were with him. They were with him a long time. They were with him intimately before, during, and after the crucifixion and resurrection. They must know what they're talking about. In fact, the Lord's own brother, James, was the leader of the church there. And they 
as they came from Jerusalem had centuries, literally millennia of cultural and religious practice which had shaped their minds, their hearts, and their spiritual awareness. As they came from Jerusalem, they came with persuasion. They had not only had the reputation and the apparent support of the apostles on their side, but they could argue that in coming from Jerusalem, they came from the place where the church was born. I mean, they came from that spot where it all started, where it was planted, where it took root, and where it was thriving and growing still. Indeed, in addition to all this, as they came from Jerusalem, they could look implicitly or expressly to the whole temple structure that center of faith community which had for, for millennia been the visible representation of religion and the symbolic and sacred place of God's presence. Everything about what these guys came down with reeked of authority and persuasiveness as they began then to impart something different, something not so new, but new to these new believers into their faith journey. And that's something, of course, as we know, and we're getting a clearer and clearer picture of, that something else was this, that this faith journey isn't just about the cross. It's about the cross and your good works. That was epitomized by their first step of being circumcised to not only bring themselves symbolically within the, co the covenant community of God, but as a gesture, as an act of obedience and, ob and observance of the law. But it certainly wouldn't stop at circumcision, but was meant to reinduce, reintroduce these new believers into the law of Moses. And against all this, there was Paul. Solitary, lonely Paul who didn't know the New Testament because he was writing it and all he had was this vision of Jesus who had appeared to him on the Damascus Road followed by three years of some mysterious training that he received I wanted to I, last after I preached last time Jack and I talked and he came up and he said you know in chapter 1 where it talks about Jesus after meeting, or after Paul, after meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus, goes and he's prepared for three years under Jesus' instruction, that that was three years. And isn't it significant that that's the same amount of time that the other apostles had with Jesus during his earthly ministry? As if to say, not only did I minister with and from Jesus, but I had three years. And not only did I have three years, I had three years by myself. But nonetheless, that certainly wasn't the thing on these legalists' mind, as they would have condemned and criticized Paul for his lack of practical experience with Jesus. And so the question that begged the Galatians then, and the question that begs us now is, who are you going to believe? The A-team, old guard from the mothership. Or second tier, and let's be honest, Paul's kind of second tier. The second tier apostle, Paul. The solitary, lone ranger, flip-flopper, Paul. I mean, he's a flip-flopper, folks. I mean, look at him. He's at one point in his life committed to the idea that this Christianity thing was a hoax and a fraud and dedicated his life to stamping it out. Now he's on our side? Whatever. And so these Judaizers, these legalists, these strict Jewish observers from Jerusalem must have had confidence that folks would believe them and not Paul. But as we continued to come to this question in Paul's letter, it's important for us to acknowledge and to understand that this wasn't just a question for the Galatians. 
though the issue takes front and center and in a uniquely forceful way in Paul's letter here, the question was pressing upon churches throughout first century Christianity. I mean, this was a common question. This was a big issue for the whole church, not just in Galatia. We know this because it is common to Paul's letters, and this is a constant theme of the New Testament Scripture. We can look to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, for instance, where we find Paul again addressing this issue in the issues of foundational truths of the faith, when he wrote, This will be my third visit to you, and on my return I will not spare those who sinned earlier. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. He is determined to know that what they're building, their lives, their eternities, their church, their faith on, is the foundational truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ and no other gospel. Are you in the faith? And he was careful in writing to the Romans to solidly establish this true faith when in chapter 3, verse 21, he wrote, But now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. For we maintain that man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Over and over and over again. Not just Paul, but the biblical writers generally make it so clear to us and drive the point home that this journey that we're on together in faith in Jesus is by His grace and by faith in Him alone. Period. So the question was, for Christians everywhere, then and now, and here's the question, Will you trust in Christ? Will you trust in Christ for your life, for your eternity? And will you trust in Him alone? Or will you trust in doing good? Will you believe and trust in Jesus? Or are you going to keep trying to please God, to gain acceptance by God, by living a good life? I was at a funeral, or preparing for a funeral recently, and I was meeting with a family, and I asked them when I had them together, after we had talked for quite a while, I said, where did your grandma think she was going when she died, and why? Little E.E. spin, right? Where did she think she was going, and why? And here was the answer. You ready? This is going to blow your mind. This is such a unique answer. You've probably never heard anything like this before. She said, they said, she's going to heaven. She knew that she would be going to heaven. And we know that she's going to heaven, or she did, because she believed in God and she was a good person. Never heard that before, right? Holy cow, it's everywhere. If we think that Paul answered the question once and for all and that the church got it and the church had moved past any questions about whether we could earn our way into heaven, we're wrong. Because this kind of mindset prevails in so many of us in the church still today. That same old war between the cross and the cross alone and, and works is alive and well. You know, we don't have you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of established Jewish religion and customs going against us, necessarily, or per se, because we're not Jewish. And so that's not necessarily this, this, this thing that the legalists bring to bear in helping to persuade us and bring them into this legalistic, works-oriented righteousness. But we have disadvantages nonetheless. And in some ways, disadvantages that are equally as strong and influential over us as they would have been for a first century new Christian Jew hearing this. I can think of three things that are out to get us and out to influence and to to pollute our minds with wrong teaching about how works is necessary for heaven. The first of those is this. 
the American dream mentality. Now, you hear me talk about the American dream sometimes, and usually in a disparaging way. I'm all for the American dream. I think this is an amazing country. I think capitalism rocks. But there are aspects of the American dream which find their way into our spiritual thinking which are horrible. It's this American dream mentality which, when it influences us spiritually, which is reinforced from cradle to grave, that tells us that hard work pays off. Hard work pays off. And this is true, isn't it? It does. And so it's only natural that that would apply to my life spiritually as well as circumstantially, right? Right. Wrong. Two, we have working against us a grossly inaccurate understanding of God's heart and God's character. We read about God's mercy. We read about God's grace. We read about how God loved us so much that he did certain things for us. But what I think that we feel, what I think we experience most intensely, and this isn't his fault but ours, we feel is justice and his judgment. And we know in our heart of hearts, down deep in that flesh, which is supposed to be dead, that God won't be pleased with me truly. That God really can't accept me unless I live a life that's pleasing to him through observing the law. And finally, we have against us a polluted nature which is self-centered and proud and fiercely independent. We want to believe. In some levels, we need to believe that you can't get something for nothing. And that if I get something, if something good happens to me or something good comes my way, then my pride and my self-centeredness and my fierce independence inform me, it's God, it must have been from you. You did it. You earned it. You achieved it. And you deserve it. And so even as we hear the echoes of the voices of those Judaizers 2,000 years later, their words, their persuasion is just as effective on us as it ever was. Because we have distinct disadvantages. The rest of our lives, and indeed the rest of our forevers, depends on how we answer this question. Will we trust in Christ and Christ alone? or on our good deeds. Now, although none of us here would probably answer this question verbally this way, many of our lives would suggest that our answer is this. Ha! Both. It's both. I believe in Jesus. Remember the answer? Why is your grandma going to heaven? Because she believed in God and she was a good person. It's both. Right? No! It can't be. Paul says in this very chapter we're discussing that it can't be. And he says in chapter 5, a little bit later, as as we continue to study his words to us, that those who are trying to justify themselves by observing the law have alienated themselves from Christ. You try to earn your way in, you're you're not going to have a hard time with it, like, you're not going to just find it, it's impossible to do that. You are alienating yourselves from Jesus. Why? Here's why. Because if it was possible for any one of us to live a perfect and pleasing life before God, and therefore to earn his acceptance, then Jesus' death would have been for nothing. And when we start to live from an attitude and from a heart that tells us we've got to earn his acceptance, we are offending and assaulting the work and the ministry of Jesus Christ on the cross by saying, it didn't work. It's not enough. And that's bad. And so, as we return to the narrative with this burning question and re-enters Paul's instruction at chapter 2, verse 11, as we, were, as we heard earlier from Duane. We see that, that 
that, that Paul is both talking about something new as he begins to address his conversation and his conflict with Peter, but at the same time as we examine it, we'll see that he's not necessarily talking about anything new at all, but coming closer and closer to the heart of his message of the one immovable gospel. I want to read this section. Dwayne read it from, from, I think you read the NIV. I want to read this same story from the message, which is an iteration of Scripture in terms that, that, that we are more commonly fluent with. Beginning at verse 11. Later, when Peter came to Antioch, I had a face-to-face confrontation with him because he was clearly out of line. Here's the situation. Earlier, before certain persons had come from James, Peter regularly ate with the non-Jews. It's interesting, in the NIV and in other translations, this this is uh, uh, Gentile sinners. And that word sinners there isn't a moral judgment, but it's nothing really more than a a reflection of the long-held Jewish understanding that you had on one hand God's people, and on the other hand, everybody else who were sinners, who were heretics, who were the Gentiles. And so, as he discusses Peter's having once eaten eaten with those non-Jews regularly, He goes on, but when that conservative group came down from Jerusalem, he cautiously pulled back and put as much distance as he could manage between himself and his non-Jewish friends. That's how fearful he was of the conservative Jewish clique that's been pushing the old system of circumcision and the law. Unfortunately, the rest of the Jews in Antioch church joined in that hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was swept along in the charade. But when I saw that they were not maintaining a steady, straight course according to the message, I spoke up to Peter in front of them all. If you, a Jew, live like a non-Jew when you're not being observed by the watchdogs from Jerusalem, what right do you have to require non-Jews to conform to Jewish customs? to make a favorable impression on your old Jerusalem cronies. We Jews know that we have no advantage of birth over non-Jewish sinners. We know very well that we are not set right with God by rule-keeping, but only through personal faith in Jesus Christ. How do we know? We tried it. And we had the best system of rules in the world has ever seen. Convinced that no human being is God by trusting in the Messiah and not by trying to be good. Have some of you noticed that we are not yet perfect? No great surprise, right? And are you ready to make the accusation that since people like me who go through Christ in order to get things right with God aren't perfectly virtuous, Christ must therefore be an accessory to sin? This accusation is frivolous. If I was trying to be good, I would be rebuilding the same old barn that I tore down. I would be acting like a charlatan. What actually took place is this. I tried keeping rules and working my head off to please God, and it didn't work. So I quit being a law man so that I could be God's man. Christ's life showed me how and enabled me to do it. I identified myself completely with him. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. It is no longer important that I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion, and I am no longer driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. The life you see me living is not mine, but it is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am not going to go back on that. I read ahead a little bit because I want to tease you and prepare you for next week's discussion. I can't wait to learn what that means. Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body is a life I live by faith in Christ. But this week, let's see how far we can get and 
in understanding and seeing what Paul's up to in reporting about his confrontation with Peter. We see that the trouble Paul confronts in chapter 1 and early in chapter 2 isn't over. There's more. And it centers around one of the vital new traditions of the early church. As the early church was forming and grew, one of the things that they were dedicated to and one of the things that they were characterized for was their love feast, their agape or love feast. They would pool their resources and host a great meal for the whole congregation. And they would come together and celebrate and worship Jesus over a delicious and abundant meal as a picture of first century early church fellowship that I'm hoping that as we meet Thursday and beyond we can begin to tap into and understand because it was a vibrant and life-giving thing as they gathered together for these agape feasts it was a beautiful living illustration of Jesus's heart in expressing too that the world will know you are mine by the way you love each other this sounds like a lovely thing but it was certainly harder to manage than we might think, especially for those congregations, which was most, that had both Jews and non-Jews. You see, it was not normal for Jews to eat with Gentiles. None of you would know that. None of us would know that because none of us are Jews, I don't think. But it's true. Here again, as we think particularly about those narrow, strict, and rigid Jews, the idea of eating with Gentiles was anathema. Major no-no. Here again, we can almost hear the appeal of those legalists who came down from Jerusalem to try to influence the direction of this new church. The proper regard for Jews was as God's chosen people to the exclusion and rejection of all others. Where did they get that? God's Word. They could cite God's Word in Psalm 2, chapter 2 in particular, and reminding the Christian Jews that the Lord is merciful and gracious, but He is only gracious to the Israelites. The other nations He will terrify. All of this being spoken into this observation that you're eating with the Gentiles? The nations, they would quote biblically, are as stubble or straw, which shall be burned as chaff. If a man repents, they would say, God will accept him, but that applies only as to Israel and to no other nation. A strict Jew was forbidden to even do business with a Gentile. A strict Jew was forbidden to go on a journey with a Gentile. A Jew would have been in the wrong if he accepted hospitality from a Gentile or extended hospitality to a Gentile. These and other stark differences between Jewish people and all other people could be cited biblically over and over and over again by these people who are coming down and seeing Peter and other Jews eating meals with Gentile believers. So in Antioch, where Peter had come to visit Paul, a great problem arose. When Peter came, at first, he disregarded the old taboos and restrictions of the religious or the Jewish religious custom and reveled in the glory of this new faith. What did Paul say? That in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, male or female that there's now this beautiful one class, there's just one class of Christian, and it's Christ follower, without regard to ethnic or racial background or geographical background or economic background, just one group. And in fact, this was reinforced to Peter as he's enjoying this, this, this crazy and neat new thing of this faith where he's having meals with Gentiles. Of course, he, he would know this, right? Because he had a specific vision affirming that this was the way it should be. They got spoke to him to make sure that he understood this is not only okay, this is good. But when these guys from Jerusalem come down, 
and begin to influence and to question and to prod and, and probably even, in many cases, a, a, a silent disapproval of what Peter was doing. Paul describes how he began to pull back from that and began to distance himself and his relationships with these non-Jewish Christians. And that as he began to do so, and his example became more and more visible, the other Jews followed suit. So that even Barnabas, who Paul thought would be above reproach in this regard, even Barnabas was, was pulled into the hypocrisy. And so all of a sudden, these guys from Jerusalem have come down, and like that, maybe not like that, but eventually they've created uh, all over again these two classes of Christian, Jews and non-Jews. Why does Paul talk about this? Why, why in, in the course of Paul's discussion here, does he go back and tell a story that didn't even happen in Galatia, but happened in Antioch involving Peter? Is it because Paul thought it was important to emphasize to these new believers that there's only one class of Christians, and this is a good story to prove it? Certainly. But it's certainly far more than that, too. You see, because what... Paul recognized in Peter's decision and in Peter's conduct was this, that Peter's choice of who he had dinner with reflected more than a class struggle. But as Peter removed himself from the Gentiles and began to associate himself exclusively with the Jews, what he was really doing was affirming the law. And so it's a lot bigger than a feast a lot bigger than a dinner companion, that what Paul saw rightly and wisely and confronted Peter about was, look, you're confusing these Christians. You're confusing these, these young believers because by your actions, you are communicating to them that the law is the deal. And haven't we decided? Haven't we agreed? Haven't we taken firmly a hold of the truth that man can never be justified by observing the law, but by Christ and by Christ alone? And if that's true, that's what you'll teach. If that's true, that's what you'll model. And if that's true, you won't engage anymore in this ridiculous nonsense of separating yourselves from the Gentiles to be exclusively with the Jews. So this ultimate question was the question of law versus grace. And as Paul says, I can never abandon grace. I will never abandon grace. Because it and it alone is the key to this journey, to my life and to my eternity. We're not done talking about this concept by a long shot because Paul's not. As we continue to read him, we're going to see that his argument just gets deeper and deeper. And he's going to bring in some other issues, but the one thing that we will see continuing throughout Paul's letter is this insistence that they get the gospel right. And I want to implore us that we, that we continue... <sighs> I just hope we get this. I just hope we get this. And I'll tell you, for so many of us, the, the get it, we, we got it here, right? We, we, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's by grace. And grace alone, through the gift of life offered by Jesus on the cross, and it's not my good works or, or being a good person that get me there. But then we go out and we, even internally and externally, begin to live lives that speak of something else that we begin to operate under the guilt and shame of not living up to God's expectations. And we begin to wonder, if I lost my salvation because I continue to struggle in this area or that? And like Peter, we begin to live one life publicly because we, we're, we have this, this pressure of appearing righteous, good deeds righteous, in the presence of others. And so it's this very, this, this very confusion about the law versus grace, I think, which frustrates our ability to connect and to be a church together. Because as long as Jerry feels like he can't admit to a deep, dark problem that he's having in his life, because it will mean rejection by the church and a rejection by God, he's not going to dare talk about that. 
he's going to show up having it all together every Sunday, like the rest of us. And that starts to get old, doesn't it? Until and unless we understand that our acceptance before God has nothing to do with pleasing him through good works, but through one thing and one thing only, accepting that Jesus Christ died on a cross to forgive us and to give us life. Let's pray. God, if there's if there's one thing and one thing only that we would ever get exactly right I am convinced this is it Lord we we labor and toil under misgivings and misconceptions about this faith journey that we're on so that we become a confused mess and Father it's because of the of those disadvantages of our culture and of our self-centeredness and Father unfortunately even because of, of so much of how the, the, the church culture has functioned and operated in our past that we still find ourselves trapped by this convincing argument that our relationship with you our acceptance by you depends upon the good things that we do and that stinks because we know we can't Lord help us in the same way that the hearer, the first hearers of Paul's letter in choosing whether to, 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 to accept what Paul said or to accept what the Judaizers said, in the same way that they could only choose right if they, if they followed their, th that argument which gave peace to their heart and to their souls. We ask that your spirit would minister to us to give us the peace and the assurance that the gospel of Paul is the gospel. A gospel that sets us free and grants us an eternity of relationship with you if we will recognize our sin, our offense against you, confess that there's nothing we could ever do in our own to make that right, and to gladly and wholeheartedly accept the gift of life through Jesus' death for us on the cross. Lord, speak this to us and keep speaking this to us through your word and through your spirit until we not only grasp this with our minds and agree to it intellectually, but that it might begin to shape the very lives we live and grant us the freedom from the law that the gospel intends. Freedom to live and to live abundantly. In Jesus' name.